finally played a Nintendo <gasps> game. My first one for the channel. Like, please don't copyright strike me for a Kawasan. I promise. I promise. I'll only say lovely things. Mostly. Yes, I finally played Metroid Prime and for a first attempt at a Metroid game in the third dimension, this is just an incredibly informative, transformative, and compelling experience. Minus a few points that make me wish this were a little more than just a remaster. Maybe a uh, remake stir? So yeah, stay tuned for a space pirate blasting, half pipe rolling, backtracking rendition of No Stout. 2002, a year filled with blonde tips, crank anchors, and a varietal of jennies from a multitude of blocks. Can you even imagine trying to explain crank yankers to anyone under the age of like 25? Like, how was that even a possibility? Didn't you just check the caller ID for potential spam? God, I'm old. And so were the fifth generation of consoles. Long in the tooth were 32 bits and 64 bits, soon to be replaced by consoles no longer seeming very concerned with such metrics. Officially supplanting bits for showy words like emotion, gecko, and celeron, the current crop of consoles were revving up for their heyday. I myself had retired an original PlayStation 1 with that PSM smiley lid sticker for a shiny, brand new PS2. I remember just rotating the little PlayStation logo for about five minutes. What a cool touch on a super cool looking console. Still reigning as the highest selling console of all time. I certainly had my hands full with launch titles in the first round of games, including DMC1, SSX, and Tekken Tag Tournament. Nintendo's purple machine that could had launched just a few months before, and the GameCube promised not only more power than the N64, but more mature offerings as the big end felt money leaving their pockets as they let the quickly aging teen slash early adult demographic flounder with their more child friendly offerings. Games such as Resident Evil Remake may not have been the slam dunk commercial success they had initially hoped for, but it did begin to move the needle on the types of games that Nintendo would make and stood as a critical darling, showing they weren't afraid to get their hands dirty or I guess a little bloody. The Metroid franchise had always been intriguing to me. Being that I spent the majority of my childhood without a Nintendo console, I wasn't familiar with the series the way that I exactly wanted to be. I loved the combination of an alien aesthetic, a strong female lead, also not unlike Alien, and all the blasting and exploring it all entailed. Until Dread, I had never played a Metroid game for longer than maybe 30 minutes or an hour. That game really blew me away and gave me insight into the front half of the Metroidvania portmanteau that has dominated a big chunk of my gaming time since I first heard that sweet, sweet symbol. I'm interested. Now, in Metroid this. Prime was initially released on November 18, 2002 in North America and would arrive in early 2003 on Japanese and European shelves. The release coincided with the GBA game Metroid Fusion, ending an eight year long drought for the franchise, with the last major release being on the Super Nintendo, Super Metroid. Now, was it worth the nearly decade long wait then or the nearly 21 years since? Well, let's go ahead and get into it. Metroid Prime marks a major series first, the addition of the Z axis. Not only the third dimension, but the first um, perspective or first person perspective, I guess. Because until this point in history, Metroid had been a side scrolling, run and gun and explore affair. This was a massive change in gameplay style and relatively unprecedented from Nintendo up until this point. According to Shigeru Miyamoto, the primary reason no Metroid came out on the Nintendo 64 was that they just didn't have any decent ideas. Chiefly, they weren't even sure how to use the Nintendo 64 controller to handle Samus. That thing kind of always struck me as looking a little bit like a Metroid itself. Enter Retro Studios. Founded in 1998, the studio's head, Jeff Spangenberg, had previously created and worked on Turok, which was viewed as 
uber useful to Nintendo as they sought after that older demographic. While none of their early games were particularly impressive, all being shelved, their engine, the Metaphors, impressed Miyamoto enough to suggest that they use its power for the good of Talon 4 and all of its inhabitants. Announced at E3 2001, players were initially not sold on a first person perspective. Hmm, it seems that even uh, 20 something years ago, video game fans could be an insufferable group. Absolutely mortified of change. Luckily, uh, unless you were on the forums and message boards of old, you could get away with not knowing the dour nature of these mouth breathers. Ah, the good old days. But man, when it came out in early winter 2002, I mean, lots of people were eating crow. To say the game is beloved would be a gross understatement. Released to universal acclaim from both critics and fans, the original Metroid Prime sits at a 97% on Metacritic with an 8.9 user score based on close to 1500 reviews. For many players, it is the greatest GameCube game ever made, as well as one of the most important. Metacritic also slates it as the 19th best game ever made, with game rankings having it as high as number seven. To list what was praised about this game would be to give you a bulleted list of everything in it. So. I'll just leave it at that. Prime's reputation truly just precedes itself. The game sold close to 1.5 million units in the States. Between all other regions, it has sold over 2.8 million copies, placing it in the top 10 best-selling games on the GameCube and the best-selling Metroid in the franchise, well, at least until Dread topped it recently with nearly 3 million in sales. I'd imagine this remaster will help its cause, however, and if you combine them, I'm confident it will be back on top if it's not already a true critical and commercial success now this is the part of my script where i stop writing and ask chat gpt to summarize the story in a chatty conversational way but really um it's not a whole lot to say about this the best parts of the story can be found in the lore atmospheric storytelling and world building as you read scripts from the Chozo throughout the environment, as well as the oft interesting scannable objects in the world. And they are for sure worth scanning because the extras you get for filling out your codec, new to the remaster, are super cool. Lots of up close rotatable models, concept art, and other goodies that give you a lot of the background on the game's development. Perfect for longtime fans. But for the thoroughness of the video, I will provide you a brief synopsis. Uh, Samus receives a beacon that there's a potential space pirate colony on Talon 4 and she goes to fucking check it out. I mean, there you go. The rest I'll leave up to the really cool and frankly groundbreaking for the time, manner in which the world is built up as you explore. That's not even to mention the fact that Samus is like the original video game heroine and such a badass. I do wish she'd at least utter a word every now and again, which may be against most of the fandom's opinion. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there for her to be more expressive and sympathetic versus just a silent protagonist. Anyway, let's talk about that exploration and the primary gameplay elements involved in Metroid Prime. Nintendo was very clear at the time that this was not a first person shooter. This was a first person adventure. Discovery, traversal, and exploration are absolutely front and center in this game and seem to have more importance placed on them than the combat. Now, what initially struck me as I started playing the game was that it felt quite good to play. I know the controls of the original have been changed dramatically. That era of 3D control was an absolute nightmare. But if you're entering the series at the remaster like I am, you will feel familiar from pretty much anything in the first person ever. Jumping and locking on is a little stiff, and you can feel that even with the modern controls struggling to keep up at times, especially with some platforming and combat elements. But overall, things have aged relatively gracefully. As is the case in any good Metroid, you start out fully powered up, getting to, uh, flex your powers and need to quickly lose them due to some straight BS. This always acts as a catalyst as you'll want to get your powers back as quickly as you can. And those powers are numerous. There are a variety of different beams Samus can shoot from her arm, secret and optional weapon combos that extend your combat abilities, 
visors, energy and missile packs, and traversal upgrades to find. The Spider Ball is a personal favorite that is put to use in some super fun, though sometimes frustrating, puzzles. Now enemies early on feel very well balanced, but by the middle of the game, I found many were getting a little too spongy for the complexity level of this combat with limited AI that made them more of a drudge than enjoyable, especially on repeat visits. Certain power-ups begin to trivialize otherwise difficult enemies, like the X-ray visor versus the ghosts, which does feel good. You feel like you're getting more powerful and different beams really slice through certain classes of foes. But because enemies respawn constantly as you move away more than two or three rooms, backtracking can become a real bitch. Which, and uh, this might also get me some heat, maybe even a plasma beam right to the cheeks, but backtracking and map design in this game leaves something to be desired at times. Now this is where I appreciate what a good remake does versus just a remaster. This game seems incredibly faithful to the original vision and while this makes it a very appealing piece of history, it can sometimes feel very archaic. The exploration shifts around mid-game from fun to mildly tedious and by the final hours, incredibly so, while you hunt down a dozen artifacts to begin the end game and deal with some daft uses of platforms and grapple points. Parts of this game feel like that new puppy you brought into the house, full of life, a lot of fun, but can barely keep their feet on them, and sometimes like to shit in places they shouldn't. Um, okay, the analogy does have some shortcomings, but... Anyway, my main issue with the map layout is that it really doesn't feel as connected or interwoven as it should. Dread especially did a great job of using the lay of the land to gently lead you around from objectives, or letting you put to use new traversal tactics and mechanics. This feels like a flaw of early 3D adventure development that I think a proper remake would have stamped out. Now, moving Samus does feel good, but I don't think she has enough quick movement options in or out of combat to provide a sense of speed and weight even by the time the game ends. The shortcuts don't really feel like they loop around to where you need to be and the elevator system could use a major refresh for the modern era. Not to mention the map screen itself is a mess with no way to mark where you wanna go, no indicators of the path that you're taking and a generally poor display of the height and direction. I would be scrolling around it in a circle just to pinpoint and make sure that I'm entering the door that I actually needed to on the floor I needed to, to get to where I wanted to go. Also, doors should probably just become accessible by any beam once you've opened them once because it's a pain in the ass to have to constantly switch even after you've already entered that room before. Now I know those fingers are warming up to try to light me up because it sounds like I'm ragging on this game. but fret not there is so much to love about the gameplay in this bosses especially from about a third of the game onward are consistent standouts including some absolutely nail-biting affairs the omega pirate really got in my ass and meta ridley is no slouch either the sense of wonder and exploration continues strong throughout even when it's a bit of a pain in the ass there's always something new to pick up the puzzles are a blast to figure out combat is an enjoyable affair there truly is a lot to love about this game even in a modern context but for the sake of nostalgia i have to say they should have fixed some of this stuff to bring it up to snuff like a better map including some map markers retooling the connectedness less respawning of enemies cleaning up some of the platforming growing pains from the era, providing Samus additional movement both in traversal and in combat would have made this feel even better. I think it could have used a Dead Space style rework, leaving most of it the same, but shoring it up with the two decades of knowledge and the various strides made in this genre of game. It feels like the pioneer, the OG, that continues to live in that space. I'm sure to many that have played the game before, it feels nice to replay this classic with a fresh look and sound, but this feels like an attempt to get new fans, considering there's a sequel on the horizon. And that feels like this is a missed opportunity with so many fresh pairs of eyes on it now. Now with 
All of that said, it is a truly intriguing slice of history. And I would love to play two and three as I'm now very curious to see how this series progressed within the sequels. And I will be uh, keeping my eyes peeled for Metroid Prime 4, that's for damn sure. But more impressive than how well the game holds up, warts and all, was the fresh coat of paint from the graphics update. Watching footage of the GameCube original side by side with the remastered feels like such a loving ode. Seeing what Retro Studios and the additional secondary studios such as Iron Galaxy could do with another stab is just absolutely beautiful. I was genuinely blown away by the stylized look of everything and it really seems to lend itself to the abilities of the console. At a buttery smooth 60 frames per second, brimming with atmosphere, fog, lighting, and oozing with personality, this is what a remaster should look like. I appreciate the gritty look of the thermal visor, which really required me to look more at the shapes due to the blurry detail. It felt realistic and unique to the game. It also strikes me as being in the spirit of the original while also not being afraid to make the changes that help it to stay modern. Though, I would have liked to have seen some updated animations from quite a few enemies, especially the space pirates, as they just kind of move like they're straight out of the lowest of polygon counts sometimes getting frozen in place in the process. The audio presentation was quite impressive. I love how the environment really alters the sound of your beams, your jumps, and the general sound shaping that's done. Going underwater, in a tunnel, or switching between your variety of visors can all impact the way you hear things, and I truly appreciate that detail. Beams, bleeps, and death yelps of enemies all sound fantastic and create a nice atmospheric response. I will say, music was a bit mixed for me. That may disappoint some to hear, but I can't say these tunes really gripped me, for the most part. Kenji Yamamoto was at the helm of the soundtrack, which is equal part ambiences, field noise, and more traditional tunes. Now don't get me wrong, there are definitely some bangers on here. That one talent overworld track reminds me of Thriller, like almost directly, but I felt like the music could be lifeless and too static at times far too loopy and empty, which I presume is largely the fault of the GameCube's mini DVDs limited space. This was another opportunity where a remake could have been super useful, as I think dynamic elements within the soundtrack could really have helped the tension in fights and in exploration and bring a bit more variety to the sparse offerings. Too often I found the music would just disappear into the background, but Tracks like the title theme and that crazy swaggy Chozo Ruins main theme can redeem them a little bit. Fendrana Drift's main theme is an obvious fave too. Give yourself 10 missile expansions if you pick that sample out in my song in this video. Now don't forget to follow me on Spotify as this will be my next single titled Through the Visor. Yeah, I'll be posting about it in the community tab as well as my Discord and on my socials. All links in the description down below. All in all, the audio is very good and feels a lot like the rest of the game. So ahead of its time in many areas, but lagging well behind those that took the morph ball and ran with it since. With all that weighed and sorted, I'm sure you're wondering now, is Metroid Prime still worth playing today? Definitely, yes, for sure. Now, I know I harped on some negative aspects, uh, Often, that is because I think a game is bad, but this was because I think there's so much to enjoy about this game, I felt more let down by the things that could have been improved upon. Almost 21 years later, you can still see the passion, the innovation, the unique storytelling and atmosphere, and the many ways this game was well, well ahead of its time. It was a pioneer and so many games took from this and ran with it. But it's these things, that makes some of the game's flaws really bubble to the surface in 2023. If this remaster could have just ironed out some of those beefs I have, especially with the backtracking and the map, modernizing in the same way they did the graphics and the controls, we might be talking about a new favorite game for me. But as it stands, I'm so glad I finally got to play Metroid Prime as it is really a cornerstone of gaming history that deserves every accolade that it's received in 2002 and since. And I'm glad the franchise is finally getting the commercial success and push that I think it has long garnered. 
I just don't think Prime is still the space jump ahead of its peers and genre co-stars as it once was. Maybe Prime 4 will be the game that really takes it there for me. I'll be waiting with bated breath. Now, if you enjoyed this episode of Nostalgia, feel free to click here and watch a few more. Watch my first time takes on classics such as Kingdom Hearts and Res as I rip off those rose tinted glasses. And there are many more to come. Maybe even Kingdom Hearts 2 much sooner than later. So like, subscribe, and ring that bell. Peace.